On a personal note, I want to thank Steve for his commitment to the University of Texas and the Cockrell School. His career accomplishments alone make him a standout alumnus. But it's his character, his desire to serve others, and his advocacy for education that make him so special and qualified to address the graduates tonight. So please welcome Mr. Steve Poisner. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Finvis, for your warm welcome and that very kind introduction. It's great to be back home in Texas. In my recent tenure as California's insurance commissioner, I gave lots of speeches up and down the state of California, and I can just tell you, not all the introductions went that well. I remember speaking at a high school near my home in San Jose, and the student who introduced me had this incredibly bored look on her face. And her introduction to me was short and sweet. She said, this is Mr. Poisner. He's been an engineering geek in Silicon Valley for 20 years, and now he's into insurance. That was it. She sat down. That was the whole introduction. When I got home that evening, I couldn't help but ask my 17-year-old daughter, Rebecca, why did you introduce me that way? <laughs> That's a true story. I'm sorry to report. And I'm sure a bunch of you here today were as about as excited as Rebecca when you heard that some guy who was into insurance was going to speak today. But let me put you at ease. I promise not to talk about actuarial science or fraudulent claim statistics. Yet I do want to say a few words about the reason insurance exists. And that's because life is inherently risky. And I'd like to suggest to you that risk is a very good thing. Those of you who graduate from the Cockrell School of Engineering today richly deserve the accolades you'll receive. Let me be among the first to congratulate all of you on your significant achievement. Your professors, colleagues, friends, and parents will also offer you lots of advice, so get ready, it's coming. And much of that advice will, no doubt, suggest great caution as you step into the wider world. Because these are especially challenging times, people who care greatly about your future will urge you to stay close to home or to work in the family business or to take a job in a proven and stable company. Friends will advise you to put off your dreams until your student loans are paid or maybe choose an entry-level job with Austin Water over your passion for renewable energy. These, are, these kinds of admonitions are universally heartfelt and they're meant to keep you safe from calamity, failure, and heartache. But if you'll hear me out before you go into the real world here, just for a moment, I'd like to suggest something starkly different. My message to each of you today is take a risk. Do the very thing you're most passionate about at this moment in your life. Seize the opportunity that your accomplishment here offers you and make your life a reflection of the very best you have to give. Engineers are born risk takers after all. Really, whether in setting out long ago to build the Panama Canal or Hoover Dam and brilliantly succeeding despite dire predictions of certain failure, or in the thousands of more recent endeavors, engineers understand without taking calculated risks, progress is impossible and lives cannot be improved and deaths prevented. Perhaps no one on this stage knows better than your distinguished dean about the real challenges of risk taking at a time when we all remain very mindful of the devastation from Japan's recent earthquake. Dean Fenvis's renowned work in developing sensors to test the strength and resiliency of buildings and bridges and infrastructure in earthquake zones has saved countless lives. And he took a personal risk as well. Just a few years ago, he gambled a prestigious teaching career at the University of California, Berkeley, for a new opportunity here in Texas, where he has successfully guided Cockrell into the very top tier of engineering schools in the nation. Let's hear it for your dean. <laughs> now, I first came to Cockrell in the University of Texas after graduating from Bel Air High School in Houston. Go Cardinals. I loved it here and I thrived despite the fact that living in Jester dorm looked and felt more like a prison than the university was eager to admit. 
though I understand that it's been uh, enhanced since I was there. During my years at Cockrell, I was one of the last students. This is in 1974, mind you, and that's not that long ago. Ever required to take the then mandatory class on the slide rule. That's true, the slide rule, 1974. And I also uh, still occasionally have nightmares about the huge risks inherent in running the gigantic Texas flag onto the football field at Memorial Stadium on windy Austin afternoons during my tenure as a member of the Alpha Phi Omega Service Fraternity. <laughs> now, when I graduated from the University of Texas, the safe thing would have been to go back to Houston. But I knew I wanted to make things using my newly developed double E skills. Where are the double E's here, by the way? Yeah. yeah okay. just, just checking. So in 1978, I took the risky path and I set out for Silicon Valley where cutting edge new high tech companies were sprouting virtually every day. After a few years in California, I came up with what I thought was a great new idea for a new company. I wanted to develop life saving technology to put GPS receivers into cell phones so that when you dial 911 from the cell phone in an emergency, the police will know exactly where you're calling from. Up until that time, GPS signals could only be acquired outside of buildings and homes with a clear view of the sky where it is relatively straightforward for GPS receivers to lock in on GPS satellite signals that are coming from 12,000 miles up. They're in medium Earth orbit and they're traveling at 25,000 miles an hour across the sky. But I believe we could take GPS technology inside where many 911 emergency calls are made by developing the technology to process very weak GPS signals as they get attenuated as they pass through building materials. The development would be expensive and very uncertain. And the first venture capitalists I approached could hardly contain their laughter. One fellow wouldn't even hear me out because what I proposed was literally impossible, he claimed. Another swore I was trying to sell him witchcraft. The technology had obvious benefits for the military too, but I couldn't get anyone in the Department of Defense uh, willing to take me seriously either until I challenged a Marine colonel in the Pentagon to a test, to test my new technology against the, the military's then current soldier tracking capabilities. It was a bet the company risk. And the colonel wanted to prove that he did not need the help of a bunch of nerds in Silicon Valley. So, we met near Pier 39 in San Francisco for a showdown. The colonel outfitted a strapping 20-year-old Marine with existing equipment used by the military to track their soldiers. Its tracking system literally filled a huge backpack with a whip antenna sticking out the top. Representing my company was an out of shape 40-year-old engineer named Howie. He simply stuck the small cell phone equipped with my company's location chip in his shirt pocket and uh, off they went. But I had forgotten one small but crucial detail. San Francisco has lots of very steep hills. Inside an RV command post, the colonel and I, we watched these two dots on a computer monitor loaded with Yahoo maps, the green dot that represented the Marine and the red dot that, re that tracked Howie. Everything was fine for a while, and the two dots moved across the screen together. But then the red dot suddenly stopped as the green dot continued on, and I could see a grin begin to curl up on that colonel's face. Looks like you got a problem there, he said. But I, I couldn't imagine what it was until Howie called me. He hadn't been able to keep up with the Marine, he confessed, so he stopped at a Starbucks for a mocha latte. I couldn't believe it. Howie was a Texas A&M graduate, by the way. <laughs> it was that Marine Colonel's glowing final report about my technology that made all the difference, though, in the end. I found financial backers, and after only five years in business, I sold my company to Qualcomm. Today, that laughable, impossible so-called witchcraft technology is the industry standard. It can be found in more than 700 million mobile phones around the world, and we have saved thousands of lives with it. My next challenge was to apply what I learned as an engineer and a businessman to public service. 
I left the private sector after running high-tech companies for 20 years and went to work in the White House as a part of the counterterrorism team in the National Security Council. Uh, hard to believe that my start date was September 4th, 2001, uh, just one week before the September 11th attacks. Shortly thereafter, with the presumption that more attacks would be coming on Washington, D.C., my boss, Richard Clark, the chief counterterrorism czar for three presidents, he told me that because I hadn't originally signed up for dangerous work, he'd understand it if I chose to be reassigned to a safer location. But I told him point blank, I'm not going anywhere. Good answer, Poisoner, he said. In that case, he explained, I'd have to learn how to put on a biohazard bodysuit and gas mask in less than 30 seconds. The Secret Service agent who trained me that day warned that I needed to keep that safety suit in a gym bag and to carry it everywhere I went. So I, I took the bodysuit and gas mask home that evening, and my wife Carol and daughter Rebecca were pretty horrified to see what my new work entailed. But in spite of that admonition from the Secret Service, I never took that bag home again. After all, there were three of us in only one safety suit. I ultimately did become responsible for helping plan emergency communications at the Salt Lake City Olympics in 2002 and for devising ways to protect the internet and the power grids from cyber attacks. During that time, I was constantly aware that millions of lives depended on the quality of the work we did. We faced huge risks but that responsibilities entrusted to me were kind of a fuel that helped us do our very best. Sometimes taking risks means stopping what you're doing in your life in order to help focus on a problem in your local community. In California, 50% of the fourth graders cannot read, cannot pass basic reading proficiency tests, and over 50% of some disadvantaged groups never graduate from high school at all. I had to find out firsthand why California's public schools had plummeted from first in the nation to worst. So 30 years after my last time in a high school classroom and armed only with a sincere desire to help, I took another big risk. I taught 12th grade American government at a local high school in East San Jose for a year as a volunteer. Hardest thing I've ever done and the most rewarding. I will never forget my first day teaching. It rained and it leaked in my classroom and I had to position the trash can in the right spot there to collect the rainwater. Ultra wealthy Silicon Valley, public high school, leaky roof, shameful. Nothing is more important than fixing our public education system in this country and here's one thing I learned in the classroom, we need to rip control of the public schools out of the hands of politicians from Sacramento to Washington, D.C. And we need to move control back to the local level where it belongs and where it used to be. Do you agree? Okay, so here's my essence of my message to you today. Look to the life experiences of others to stimulate your own imagination. Use their experiences not as a template, but rather as an inspiration to help you find your own unique contributions. Look solely into your own heart for the answer to what paths you should follow in the years ahead. Whether in Silicon Valley, the White House, in the classroom, or in public service, I've discovered I really love trying to ac accomplish the so-called impossible, and I bet you'll find exactly the same thing. Nothing makes you feel more alive than setting out to do something that is difficult to achieve, then succeeding despite the inevitable challenges and even failures along the way. Cockrell Class of 2011, I heartily congratulate you today on your great achievement. And I hope each of you is already planning your next great risk. Go out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. Climb all the mountains that call you no matter what the reason. Take a risk. Then, whether you fail or succeed, take another. We're Texans, after all, and risk-taking runs through our veins. I wish you great risks, and I wish us all their great rewards. Thank you all very much, and congratulations. Thank you all.